Good afternoon, everybody. If I can have your attention, that would be lovely. Thanks. I love how that works. It just goes silent. It makes me feel really important. So before we start, I'd like to acknowledge that the Penrith Valley Chamber of Commerce values the unique status of Aboriginal people as the original owners and custodians of the lands and waters, including the lands and waters of Penrith City. We pay our respects to past, present and emerging leaders. Isn't it nice to see you all in person? <laughs> Yay, I know, it feels like such a long time since we've been able to do this. And I know there are definitely still some concerns about us gathering, so uh, on behalf of the board of the chamber, we appreciate you all taking the time to come and join us. I'd also like to just quickly thank our events committee for pulling this together. Mary, Stace, and the rest of the committee. Good job, gang. Absolutely. I think we can all agree it's been a bit of a challenging time lately, hasn't it? And whilst we're seeing some restrictions start to be removed, I think we've definitely got some challenge uh, ahead of us still. However, having said that, we're really excited to be able to bring you this event today and some fabulous guests that we've got for you. Um, just the fact that you're all here, along with some of the stories, the positive stories we've heard this morning and over the last few months, um, continued growth and development in our region, projects like Nepean Business Park, St Mary's Rail Freight Hub and a couple of other private investment projects, some government investment at all levels, council, state and federal government, are indicators of the strength of our local economy, the strength of our community and, of course, our resilience as business owners and as individuals. And that's what today's really about. So, I am personally very privileged to be able to introduce our MC for today. Chris Bath has been a journalist for 32 years because a bloke she met in a Surrey Hills restaurant in 1985 told her that she should give it a go. She dropped out of Sydney Uni as a scared, naive Westie who felt out of her depth in all of that Dead Poets Society sandstone and was waitressing her way through her first midlife crisis. Can you believe that? Turns out the advice of Sydney Morning Herald journalist Peter Bowers was great. Since 1988, she's enjoyed a front row seat to history as a reporter, an anchor, interviewing prime ministers, princes, pop stars, along with drug lords, deviants, I look around this room, and dancers. <laughs> Actually, on the subject of dancing, she rates her 2005 appearance on Dancing with the Stars as a career highlight. These days, she's a feral, semi-COVID retired veggie farmer in the lower Hunter Valley, commuting back to Sydney on weekends to read the 5 p.m. national news on Channel 10, with special guest appearances on other programs from time to time. Would you please give it up for our MC, Chris Bath. Also, I haven't worn heels for a while, so I'm a bit slow getting up to the stage. Um, it's wonderful to be here. Thank you so much for having me today. It's interesting listening to snippets of the conversation just before we got underway, and what struck me is how integrated you all are and how much you support each other in the local community and the business community. It was amazing to hear some of those stories and hear people say, oh, yeah, he, he's great, he does it for me for nothing, and then we do this. And it, It's just wonderful to see such a communal approach happening in, in Penrith and in the local region. My dad worked out here for many, many years and I just ran into Gay, who was the receptionist at Res Creek with my dad for about 10 years. She's up the back there. And I spent a large part of my childhood coming out here because there's nothing better than going to a precast concrete factory. <laughs> it was always a great adventure. So you'd go out and, you know, there were, I think, 11 blokes and Gay working out at Res Creek and... Um, just the last time she saw me, I was going off with some bloke, was I? To some job somewhere. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, we won't go there. We won't share that story. Followed a few blokes in my time. Didn't always work out that well. <sighs> the Premier's learnt that too, but we won't go there either. Um, <laughs> I do want to make special mem mention of uh, uh, some of our Platinum members who are here today. Uh, the Nepean Business Park, Lamrock Solicitors, who are foundational and platinum members. I think they put together that little goodie bag. I think we've, it's hand sanitizer, is it, that's in the goodie bag? Yep, so that's very handy for today because we are observing COVID rules, like 
just to remind you, keep your social distance. Um, please go to the bar for drinks because there's no table service for, for drinks today, so feel free to do that. But yes, we, we need to keep our distance and where possible if you could stay seated unless you're going to the bar, which is obviously essential, or going to the loo, we'd ask you to do that today. Uh, and thank you, Lamrock Solicitors, for that little goodie bag as well. Uh, Pacific National St Mary's Freight Hub are also our platinum members here today. Baker Group, I've met Ted down there. Didn't You're also a clothes designer, did you know that? Ted Baker? <laughs> Is it? Yes, yeah. Multi, multi-talented. No, haulage and fashion design. Amazing. Um, the Outback Steakhouse, thank you for being here today and for being one of our platinum members. Raft and Family Lawyers and Montecatini Specialty Small Goods, thank you very much. Our media partners today, Vintage FM, and our event sponsors. You're going to hear from our major event sponsor in just a moment. Uh, our major sponsor today is Bruce Bordenay and Dylan Bordenay of the Precinct Group and the P&B Business Park. The event sponsor, Ted Baker and the Baker Group, thank you. The drink sponsor, Asha Dooley and Grace Funerals. Technical support, Shane Conlon and National Technical Services. And additional support from Simone Thomas and the team at Lamrock Solicitors. We do have a business card draw today. Uh, if you missed it, the box is just outside the front door, I think Mary told me. So uh, we're going to be drawing that at the end of the event. So make sure you get in. We've got some great prizes that have been donated there. I have um, uh, an apology from Stuart Ayres, who couldn't be here today. He was attending, was going to be attending, but unfortunately can't make it. He sends his apologies. Uh, but we do have with us the recently re-elected Mayor of Penrith, Councillor Karen McEwen, AOM. Thank you very much for being with us today. And, of course, our very special guest, Shane Fitzsimmons, who I'm going to be grilling, absolutely grilling. He's used to fire, so he's fine with heat. That's OK. Uh, I'll be talking to him uh, a little bit later after lunch. But without further ado, ladies and gentlemen, could I please introduce our major sponsor today, Bruce Bordenay. He's the chairman of the Precinct Group and the p and Business Park Development. He's going to say a few words and show you a bit of a video as well. Thanks, Chris. Uh, it's great to be here today and, and uh, having the opportunity to sponsor the event. Uh, Commissioner Fitzsimmons, Mayor McEwen, Mr. President and ladies and gentlemen of the Chamber. I'd like to just start off by showing uh, this video. Um, if we can bring it up on the screen, that'll give you a background to the project. Uh, I'm not sure if that's quite the right file, is it? Here we go. I'll stop there because uh, there was mention of 18,000 new jobs, which you might just rewind fractionally. Um, because Nepean Business Park was looking like a great project for Penrith and small business, but I, I'm sorry to have to report today that the project is at risk. I am very pleased to uh, see Commissioner Fitzsimmons here today as the new Resilience Commissioner looking after uh, our disaster recovery because the biggest disaster we're now facing, of course, is COVID-19 and the, uh, the economic disaster that is being generated, which really the only way out of is through job creation. We've got a, almost a million people we need to get back to work. So of those 18,000 jobs uh, being created by this project, 4,000 will be local permanent jobs in Penrith and there will be $500 million worth of economic activity here in Penrith every year. However, this is all at risk due to the proposed planning controls by the New South Wales Department of Planning that will effectively halve the development potential of the site. 
which will create not only an economic viability issue, but also the loss of half of those jobs and the economic activity. These are staggering numbers in any economy. The project has received widespread report, uh, support, including from Minister Ayres, uh, Penrith Council, the Penrith Valley Chamber of Commerce, Penrith CBD Corporation, the Western Sydney Business Chamber, local business and the local community. We're receiving great support because we're providing local jobs for small business. That is the key. And at the same time, supporting the environment through the rehabilitation of a degraded quarry site and the gifting of land and construction of the Great River Walk extension. But the Nepean Business Park is now at risk due to overregulation and red tape created by proposed planning controls that threaten these local jobs and economic stimulus. Penrith has just lost thousands of jobs from the rezoning of employment land at Jordan Springs. So it's critical that we preserve these 4,000 permanent jobs here in Penrith. Why is it that our government is so positive about the recovery, about job creation, about economic stimulus on the one hand, and yet the planning department bureaucracy is, compro is compromising these great initiatives through departmental red tape and over-regulation? Penrith deserves better. It needs local jobs for small business, particularly because the majority of Penrith workers currently have to travel outside Penrith for work. Small business, as we all know, is the greatest contributor to jobs and the economy. So like it or not, this will be a small business-led COVID recovery. Something is wrong when everyone is so supportive of this project, which aligns with government policy, yet the planning department is putting the project at risk. It needs to get on board with the government's agenda now and ensure that our project and many others don't fall by the wayside. On site, we've appointed our local contractor, Baker's Group, for the rehabilitation works. Bakers are here today and have had also generously sponsored the event. Thank you, Ted Baker and, and your team. Already, there are over 100 people empl employed on the project and we've only just started. So, I would like to thank Minister Ayres, the Chamber of Commerce, the, uh, the Council and the various other chambers and the community for that tremendous support you've given us so far. We ask that you continue that support and uh, this to create a business park here that will have such a great impact on New South Wales jobs and small business and help us to overcome the major hurdles put in place by the planning department. Now, with that, I think we'll just finish off the video and uh, thank you for your attendance. Bruce, thank you very much. It was enjoyable seeing the video. Ladies and gentlemen, enjoy your lunch. We're going to take a short break and then I'll be back with the Commissioner. Thank you. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, if I could just grab your attention.
Gee, they're way more obedient for Simon. How about that? Thank you. Um, I don't know that this man needs too much introduction. He pretty much lived on your television for, oh, I don't know, six months. Probably felt like six years to you. But, um, ladies and gentlemen, I'm really happy to introduce you to you today the Resilience Commissioner, Shane Fitzsimmons, the former head of the Rural Fire Service, who did such a stunning job through those bushfires. Commissioner, thank you for being here. Thank you. I left off a title. He's also Father of the Year. <laughs> well, actually, that's, that's, is, that, is that working? Is that working? Yep. It's funny that I got that title of Father of the Year. It's a really special special um, uh, thing to be to be recognised for, but uh, as my daughter said and my friend said, how do you get Father of the Year when you were never home even seeing your daughters uh, for, for the vast majority of the year? So, We've just yeah. stolen my first question. Oh, yeah. <laughs> did, did you see much of your family, of your daughters, no, Lauren and Sarah and your wife? Not, not at all. And as a matter of fact, it was my wife and I went on the longest holiday we've ever had and we thought it was safe booking it in winter. Uh, we went off for four weeks uh, over July and um, even when I was away I started getting some messages via my phone and um, communicating with how busy things were getting back here in New South Wales because a lot of people don't realise, you won't find me using the phrase black summer uh, because for New South Wales mm. we were averaging over a thousand fires a month during winter, June, July, August and then it just built and intensified thereafter and we started losing lives in October. So. There was a lot of tragedy and damage and despair well before, well before summer. But, but um, I think we landed on the, on the Sunday uh, and I was back in the office on the Monday and, and that was in August and I think we effectively went seven days a week, 24 hours a day from there on right through to, right through to February. Um, and as, as the history books will show, uh, it was unprecedented for New South Wales. Uh, it was awful. Um, uh, and it was the most tragic fire season we've ever experienced in the state's history. A lot of what we're going to talk about today is resilience and, and how people can help that translate into their businesses. But part of running a business and part of being the boss of something is looking after your own resilience. How did you do that during the fire season? I mean, you couldn't have been having that much sleep. No, it wasn't. And like everybody else, it was, a, it was an extraordinary commitment. I was part of a pretty significant team here in Sydney, but right across the state. And the, the, the honest truth uh, to how I looked after myself was not very well. Um, and it, it, came to, it came to bear only in the month or so after the fire season, the real wind down. But, but as a general rule, uh, I would set my alarm for 4.30 every morning. Um, there's something strange in our body clocks that every morning I never was woken by my alarm. I woke up around two minutes, five minutes, um, or a little bit earlier, depending on the night before, um, before the alarm went off. So I was able to cancel the alarm, go and get ready, didn't wake up anybody in the house, and then we just didn't know what time we were getting home later Now I know night. why you're father so, of the year, by the way. Yeah, Did all that right. without waking anybody up. Oh, that, should be, that should be husband of the year. I didn't wake up my wife. <laughs> but, the, but no, that's true. So then really late nights, and then some nights when we saw the absolute tragedy, it was just 24 hours. And ultimately... Um, uh, I put on a lot of weight uh, and then I found uh, after the fires I started getting really, really bad headaches and I didn't know why. I've never had migraines and then I went and did a blood pressure test and my blood pressure was up around 200 and something over 100 and something. So I was in these red zones and I had to go and, had to go and get attention which I was in trouble for because my wife's a nurse and my daughter's a nurse and, and why wasn't I checking myself with my blood pressure a little bit earlier. So, and as the, the specialist will tell you, um, for those of us that will have an increase in blood pressure, uh, invariably we don't know, we're not conscious of it. It's not until it gets to a really bad state that there's some symptom that emerges. So the truth is, not very well. How, how tough were those deaths during the fire season for you, given that you lost your own dad when a hazard reduction burn went wrong in a fire? You'd both been volunteer firefighters for such a long time. And I remember seeing you at a funeral with the widow of one of those men and their daughter and their sons and thinking, how on earth are you doing this? Because you must be sleep deprived. Was unaware of your high blood pressure at that stage. But, so was I. 
Also, also given your own family history, you know, with your dad. How do you how do you do something like that with with television cameras all around you? Well, the funny thing is, when when you are when you are dealing with things like funerals and all those sorts of things, I'm genuinely oblivious to the cameras. They 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 they, they don't feature in my on my radar or my concern. Uh, and I think as leaders, um, we are all shaped by our experiences. Um, by our own personal journeys, uh, by the tragedies and the events that happen in our lives. Uh, we're, also, we're also guided by our own experiences in the workplace, what works well for us, what doesn't work well for us, what we appreciate in our bosses, what we don't appreciate. And I think if we're, if we're all reflective, we learn, we learn to emulate what we like and what we admire in people, and hopefully we also learn to avoid the things that really we don't like, or, or either through experience or through observation of, of sometimes those same leaders or, or, or other leaders. And having my own experience with my dad uh, in, the, in the fire service, uh, he was with National Parks at the time working full time, and in a very benign operation, a, a prescribed burn hazard reduction, which is why I get pretty defensive in any public forum where, where you see these morons that get up and say hazard reduction is really easy, we've just got to do lots more of it and blah, blah, blah. You, you are introducing lots of risk, lots of challenge uh, into the landscape and even in the most benign of conditions with the most experienced of people, things can go wrong. And on that afternoon, which was a very benign day, there was a flare up in the fire and the crew of seven were overrun by fire. Uh, Dad along with, Dad, along with um, uh, two others died on the mountain that day and um, another fellow died a month later from, from burns that he couldn't recover from in hospital and then there were three survivors. Um, uh, one survivor uh, was, was never able to mentally or physically uh, reconnect and, and even contribute to the Coronal Inquiry or anything like that, so his life was completely changed forever. Uh, the two other survivors, which I got to know through the Coronal Inquiry process and catching up at other events and, and memorials and things like that over the years have, have gone on to, to, to you know, fall in love, have children, uh, live lives, uh, successful lives, and both returned for employment back into National Park doing other roles, which is pretty, pretty remarkable and pretty impressive. But one of the things that really stood with me during that crisis was the criticality of, of the agency that, that, that Dad was connected to, and particularly that crew that was connected to, um, being present and caring about the, the crews and their families and what have you. And I remember a few years ago, we were doing a lot of strategic planning stuff and all the stuff you do as a business and an organisation. And I was asked a very public question by the team um, when we are trying to identify priorities. And they said to me, what's the one thing that keeps you awake at night? And I said, well, it's a serious injury or the death of one of our volunteers or staff uh, on the fire ground. I can think of nothing worse. And then when you reflect on this season, with all that unfolded, uh, day after day, week after week, month after month, um, a couple of those instinctive leadership traits just kept coming back to me in my mind. And one was always about authenticity. Um, you've got to be the real you. No one wants the facade. No one wants you to fill gaps or pose or, 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 or respond to answers and questions you don't know the answer to. People will see through those falsehoods. There's nothing wrong with being a better you and the best you you can, but, but, but embrace and own and understand your limitations because everybody knows them and sees them anyway. So being authentic is really important. And there's no point sugarcoating, you know, a dog crap sandwich when everyone knows it's a dog crap sandwich. So, so, so when things are really bad, we've got to be really clear uh, and, and convey a message uh, that confirms the reality of where we're at. I think the second thing was around humility and, and, uh, humility and empathy. So again, it gets back to the point of, as leader, it's not about you, it's actually about everybody else. And in our case, it was about the men and women um, uh, not just the volunteers and the staff of the RFS, but, but certainly for me that was the priority, but it was the entire workforce. Men and women on the front line, behind the scenes, their families and loved ones. 24 hours a day, we were averaging three and a half to five and a half thousand people uh, in the field, in control centres, in staging areas, day and night to sustain the operation. Um, um, knowing, knowing your people, knowing your, your community or your customer is really important. Um, knowing and understanding your colleagues, your subordinates, and of course, we often forget our supervisors or our masters. Understanding um, uh, that it's all about them and you've just got a role to play in that space. Um, I think the other, the other really important aspect is around 
uh, respect. So whilst you've got a perspective and you've got a role, you've generally got to value and appreciate and buy in all the different perspectives, all the different arguments, all the different beliefs about what's occurring, why it's occurring, and genuinely factor that in and buy that into the decisions that are going to be taken and the actions that are going to be taken. We were making some pretty big decisions and taking some extraordinary action that we knew directly correlated with uh, increased risk, but it was considered risk, uh, and the option of doing nothing was a greater risk. We were making decisions that we knew would have a, a, a detrimental effect uh, and a dislocation on society. We were moving tens of thousands of people at a time. We were making decisions that would ultimately issue into directions uh, and guidance, uh, all based on the premise of trying to increase people's prospect of survivability, saving themselves, saving their loved ones, saving their homes and businesses. And those decisions weigh very heavily. Um, so making decisions and taking actions is critical, providing you can uh, garner the best possible intelligence and opinions and, 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 and qualifications around you to help make those decisions. But in crisis times, you've got to make those decisions. I think, I think the other really important thing uh, is to recognise um, that leaders need to actually care. So we don't talk about it enough in leadership circles, but the word care, C-A-R-E, matters a lot. And getting right back to your question um, about, about losing firefighters, um, um, as, as leaders, you care about what it is you're doing, you care about your role, you most importantly care about your teams, um, and you're also caring about your customers or, 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 or for me, the community uh, during that particular time. And part of that care aspect ties in very much with what I talked about before. It's actually about being authentic, it's about being vulnerable, it's about being open, it's actually about recognising that this is about others and, and, if, and, if, and if something goes wrong on your watch then that's going to hurt and that's going to matter. Um, when you're communicating decisions and actions and explaining why they're occurring, People are generally happy with decisions they don't like, then no decision at all, you know? So if you can explain the decision, and if you genuinely care, <clears throat> that should shine through in those sorts of decisions, in those actions, and the way, you're, the way you're communicating. Every press conference I did, I was almost oblivious of all the cameras in a way, because all I kept seeing in my mind was two broad audiences. One was the men and women on the front line and behind the scenes turning up day after day relentlessly, despite no signal of reprieve and, and, and no relief in the weather, uh, them and their families. And the second big audience was all the people being affected, impacted, losing everything they've ever worked for, losing their homes, losing their businesses and losing loved ones. So the criticality for me, um, the minute we got intelligence that, that something had gone horribly wrong with serious injury slash death of firefighters, it was actually about being present. And I remember the very first call, and I'll never forget the... These dates will be etched in my mind forever. 19th of December, 30th of December, 31st of December, 23rd of January. And on the night of the 19th of December, not too far from here as a crow flies, uh, down in the south southwestern areas of Sydney, getting a call, Just I just got home. Um, we'd knocked off from the office, got home. It was about midnight. I was about to climb into bed. And my deputy, Rob Rogers, who's now the commissioner, which is a great, great thing for the RFS, um, gave me a call to say, we've got some intelligence coming through. It's very early. There's been a nasty accident. Looks like there's some seriously injured people uh, and that might even be fatality. And I said, well, you need to let us know pretty quickly. And I'd, I'd literally just had a shower and hopped into bed. And I, well, first thing I did was just get up and start getting dressed again because I thought this is not going to go well, even if it's serious injury, to be getting this report at night. So then as, as we played it out, um, um, got the confirmation, drove down, caught up with the people on the accident scene, fellow crew that were there, very distraught people, um, went back to a local fire station, um, did some peer review, counselling, catch up with teams, um, and then once we were able to, to clear an hour or so with them, uh, then going back to the families of the, of the fallen firefighters uh, and spending time with mums and dads, wives, toddlers, brothers, sister-in-laws, all those sorts of things. Um, extremely difficult, um, but, but that happened then, it happened again down near in the southern border region um, near, 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 near um, Albury. Um, but there's something very significant about that presence. And whilst it, whilst it will go down in my life uh, as events that genuinely changed me forever and were the most difficult I'd ever done 
um, or, or endured as a, as a leader, um, I will always treasure um, the sacredness um, of, of that privilege of being welcomed into the home and having conversations about, about things uh, when people are, are at their most at their most darkest moment, um, trying to comprehend the reality of their loved one not coming back through the door. So being present and then making sure you're honest and open as much as you can with what we know, what we don't know, what we're doing, what we're not doing, what we can do, what we can't do, uh, and most importantly, what we're going to do to support them really mattered. And then to, to see that relationship and that connection extend through to uh, being invited uh, to be part of things like funerals and memorial services and, and as it turns out with, with young Megan, the wife of Sam down, down near Holbrook, to be, to be some of the first to get messages around the arrival of their first baby which Sam never got to meet and, and to have her share those photos and details with you, it's, it's pretty special and um, like so many people across this fire season, lives were changed forever uh, and my life was absolutely changed forever. I guess in this room for a lot of people, you've, you've got your own version of that now with COVID-19. Mm -hmm. And I'm guessing that a lot of you are leaders in your own businesses, so you, you can take on board those messages about authenticity and, and caring. But is there another way as well to build resilience in your staff, to build resilience in people who are facing an enemy that you just can't see right now? Absolutely. And, and that, is, that is the big difference with COVID. And there's... A, there's there's a phrase I will never use when it comes to COVID. I won't use social distancing, because as we've seen, um, as we've seen in New South Wales, so we've had we've had lots of New South Wales on their knees with drought and all that comes with the implications of drought. That was then the the precursor to the worst ever bushfire season we've had, and invariably a lot of the drought affected communities were also belted by bushfire. Uh, then we've seen when the weather finally broke to give us some reprieve in the bushfires. We then saw lots of uh, rainfall events, massive erosion, flooding. So whatever farmers and other landholders had left on their property after a denuded landscape from fires and droughts, it was all washed away in the, uh, in the floods. And it's not too far from here up in the Hawkesbury. I visited areas where the ground level is now a half a metre different. You know? So that's there, changed landscapes and things all over the place. Um, and then you add COVID onto that um, and, and the implications of responding to and managing a, a COVID pandemic and trying to keep society safe, the last thing we want to be prosecuting is social distancing. What we want to be prosecuting, and I understand the intent of it, is physical distancing. And what's been pleasing uh, in my new role and what I saw leaving the RFS is that as a society, I've seen it uh, in my own, in my own uh, world, but I've also seen it out in the field across all these disaster affected areas, is that there is a deliberateness and a consciousness to actually connect uh, and, and signal out and for bosses and, and small business being really open and clear with their, with their teams, with their employees, with their customers about where they're at, what's going on, how they're working through it. And we're only talking about it at the table. If I hear another, you know, the, these words that we've all become, you know, new to in this last six months like Zoom and if I hear pivot one more time, I think I'm going to die. But, you know, so, so, you know, and you're on mute, mate, you're on mute, you know, all these sorts of things. So, so but, but, but when you talk to people and we're taking advantage of these new tools and these new techniques, people are openly saying, I've never had this much contact with my boss before. I've never had this much contact with colleagues in my, with my organisation before. People are also saying to me, I've been, I've connected more with my brother and my sister and my mum in this six months of 2020 than I did in the entirety of, you know, 2019. Something has triggered us all to make sure we are reaching out and we're connecting, we're looking out for each other because it's invisible and because we're all affected, it's not like a normal disaster or a normal event where we all feel sorry for the area that's affected and usually it's geographically constrained. This is ubiquitous in, in its true form. It's, it's actually genuinely affecting everybody even if we don't know of someone who's actually contracted COVID. But the implications of responding to COVID is having a massive effect. And you look at unemployment, you look at, you look at job dislocation, you look at, you look at business downturn, but then uh, but as, that, as that seesaw goes down, you look at the other side, and there's lots of other areas of the business sector and community sector 
that are going gangbusters and that are, that are, that are benefiting from you know, this, this dramatic change. So it's tough. So, so for, 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 for organisations, for businesses, for, for families, it's actually about um, openly talking about what's going on, what the implications are. Don't keep secrets. A, 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 a team of employees that are part of a business that know where that business is at and what the implications are of the current operating environment and what if we don't get this and what if we don't get that, they're more inclined to be binding in and locking in with the management and the leadership to do their bit and pull their weight and make adjustments and work out the offsets. So management doesn't always have to come up with the answers. So, so what we're finding is, and through, through the last season, you know, we've, we've had um, uh, over 20,000 businesses across New South Wales, hundreds of millions of dollars worth of grants, you know, $10,000 grants, $50,000 grants, primary producers. Um, we, we've got record amounts of money going into recovery just in the bushfire sense, let alone the overlay that's coming with COVID. And we've got to be making sure that as employees and as employers, we are more conscious now about managing physical distance and distancing and all that comes with COVID safe, but upping our approach on communication and, and social connectedness and not exacerbating isolation and loneliness and, and anxiety and despair with the fear that people have of whether they're gonna have a job tomorrow, whether the business is gonna be running tomorrow. And that goes for owners and, and workers alike. You know, there's, there's a lot of shared stress that's going on across society right now. How do you see us transitioning out of COVID? Or what are the answers for you? It's interesting because whilst we can probably draw, you know, a, 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 a rather fat line um, when we went into COVID or we knew we were dealing with a COVID um, response and all that came with it because what happens was there was, there was lots of notable and announceable changes to restrictions, to arrangements, to all those sorts of things. I don't see, this, I don't see quite the same line of distinction that says we're out of COVID. So, so I, I, I don't know if that makes sense, but, but I, I think we're going to transition... We're not, we're not going to step back to the same pre-COVID world. I, I, think we, I think we're going to transition to a new living with COVID, post-COVID outbreak. I don't know what the right language is, but, but it's going to be something different. And I don't know that we're going to be able to readily draw the line that says we're now at the other side of COVID. It might come with vaccines. It might come with new ways of doing things. It might come with new you know, rapid testing and those sorts of things so we can do things a little bit differently. But all the all the all the um, um, what do we call them? The, the all the vaccinations. Um, we're focusing on the strain now. So whether there's there's more learnings and more knowledge coming out with second waves and, and mutations and variations. So so I don't know what what the next wave is. But but what we are seeing is we're seeing people um, and businesses and governments recognizing the need to adapt and change um, in in things like processing in. In, in, in industrial relations matters, in workforce planning arrangements, in, in office space and decisions around footprints and, and whether you need this floor plate or that floor plate or is there a different way of doing business? Do you, do you just deliver straight to customers rather than rely on customers coming to you? A lot of that discussion in, in uh, business chambers and other sectors that I've had the benefit of spending time with over the last five to 10 years, the narrative has always been I can see that in the future. Over the next five to 10 years, or the next, we're gonna see a big change in this space. Well, I reckon we've had a bloody big change in five to six months. And, and, and a lot of what we might have contemplated would be coming, would be materialized in the next five or 10 years is actually happening now. Um, and I don't think we're gonna go backwards from all of those sorts of things. I think they're gonna be retained uh, and exploited a little bit more going forward. So the good thing is, I think, that we are seeing governments at all levels recognise that at the heart of our, our recovery um, is business and particularly small business. They, I think we recognise the engine room of economies and, and economy is often seen as a bad word. I don't see economy as a bad word because economy links to livelihoods. Economy links to livelihoods which links to employment, which links to opportunity, which links to hope, which links to people's ability to have a sense of purpose, of belonging. Um, a role, a place, um, a capacity to provide for themselves, for their family, for their loved ones, to pay bills, to do things. So, so economy matters uh, in, 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 in the engine room of, of money, but it matters 
uh, in the livelihoods and the emotional and psychological well-being of all of us. Resilience-wise, as the Resilience Commissioner, I know you get out and about, how do you think we're tracking? How resilient are we? How are we going? I, I think it's quite remarkable. Um, um, and, and, and again, I'll, 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 I'll piggyback on the, the compounding effect of disasters across rural and regional New South Wales. So, so much of the Great Dividing Range, uh, west of the Great Dividing Range and the coastal strip, so many of those communities and businesses were absolutely terribly affected by droughts, bushfires and floods. And then on top of that, they've all had COVID. Most of the CBD area um, and the Greater Sydney Precinct has really only been on the periphery uh, of the first three big disasters, but were all invariably linked um, in, a, in a direct way with COVID. Inherently, we have this mindset that our farmers and our rural people are inherently resilient and they're pretty tough. Um, but they might get through drought, they might get through bushfire, they might get through um, storms and floods, they might get through a COVID pandemic. But what are we asking of them when all four have been affecting them and dislocating them and impacting them over the last 12 months, two years? So, so resilience as a, at, at a human level is really quite, quite challenging because I think it's ultimately, in resilience, it's funny, I'll tell you a story, Chris, I don't know if we've got time, but, but, but when, I was, when I was asked to, to talk about taking this role on, um, uh, leaving the RFS, we were talking about a role that was going to be the agency to look after disaster and emergency management for the state of New South Wales, and I said, yeah, that's a, that's a pretty good synergy with me, I get it, and we agreed to the thing and did all the paperwork and stuff, but then when it came close to announcing the new agency, this word resilience came up and they said, oh yeah, yeah, Shane, this is the new agency we've got, here's the, here's the description of how it's going to work, it's called Resilience New South Wales. And I said, bloody Resilience New South Wales, what's that? No one's going to resonate with Resilience New South Wales, I didn't sign up to Resilience New South Wales, I signed up to disaster. And I said, Shane, it's the new, it's the new thing where it's going to be much more broad and encompassing than just natural disasters. And I had to eat humble pie because in the first few months of me being in the role, I've learned that everybody's got a view on resilience, everybody. Um, um, everyone's view is not necessarily the same. I also learned across government when they identified that we were going to be this executive agency across government to keep a focus on the state's efforts around resilience that suddenly I had all these agencies saying, oh yeah, we've been waiting for this because we've got this real resilience problem, we're going to offload it to you. So I said, no, that's not our role. So, so what I have learned though out of hearing and listening and reading and doing a few things is that ultimately resilience, whether it's at the individual level, the family level, the business level, government, or most importantly, community level, is all about one's ability to anticipate and, and foresee the sorts of stresses, disruptions, impacts and disasters that could impact them and are likely to impact them. Most importantly, if, if they look at that and contemplate that, then somehow try and personalise that and, and, and own that there is a risk of this happening. So we shouldn't be surprised when disasters or disruptions happen, so we should be mentally uh, having considered it, prepared for it. More importantly, at a business level, at a family level, at a community level, we should be planning for it, preparing for it, and considering what are the things we can do now ahead of that impact then we've got to have the best possible thing we can to deal with the impact and get through it. But then, but then with that resilience, because we knew it was likely to come, we'd given some thought to it, we knew what might happen and what might be the implications, we're going to be better positioned to come out the other side and not just be the same prior to that impact, but hopefully through learning from that impact and going through the experience, come out better and grow. Um, um, and it's, it's a classic line, like, you, you've been with us in some of this stuff in the past, Chris. Even, even after all the big fire events in New South Wales, we survey the areas that are devastated by fires. And 70 to 80% of people all recognised and agreed they knew they lived in probably one of the most fire-prone areas in the country. But then the same percentage said, I knew I should have done more. And I was like, whoa. So, so then, and then, and then after the event, you know, people are left you know, in despair because you've got the grief and the tragedy and trying to work out where to from here. So, whilst I love Aussie culture and I'm a very proud Australian, 
and I love the Aussie culture of she'll be right, mate, it won't happen to me um, and we'll just get on life with being merry. The reality is things do happen. Disasters do happen. Um, you know, why do people live in bushfire prone areas and then be surprised when there's a fire at the back door? If there's people in floodplains, why are they surprised or shocked uh, when they're isolated or inundated by water? You're, lo you're looking at that at the moment in this area, Absolutely. aren't you? Absolutely. I mean, and, and I can tell you, um, uh, in the last few months, I'm learning more about water and Warragamba Dam and rainfall events and the Hawkesbury Nepean catchment and the unique nature of the, the V-shaped valleys and the Hawkesbury sandstone dissected areas around this place. But the challenge is... Um, we are, we are looking at this season um, very differently to what we saw last season. So last season was quite extraordinary, drought driven, fire was the biggest risk, lots of the state above normal for fire risk, not very much chance of flooding or rain or storm events. This season, we've actually got a pretty normal fire season. As a matter of fact, we've got an increased risk in Western New South Wales because the, the rain we've had over the last few months is, has just livened the place up. So there's a buoyancy across rural and regional areas with growth and pasture and cropping. Little side note for you, on the average in the last few years, three million tonnes of grain is all we've been able to get out of Western New South Wales in, in agriculture. This year with the growth and the rainfall, we're expecting somewhere conservative around 11 to 12 million tonnes of grain. So, so the, the, the change in the landscape is remarkable. But with my old bushfire hat on, all that new crop, all that wonderful grass growth, all that pasture feed means fire fuel and grass fires are, are underestimated. They travel three times as fast as bushfires uh, and they can, they can take livelihoods and lives very, very quickly. But it's going to be a normal fire season with a grassland risk we didn't have last year. But the big driver is there's four climate models that are really influencing the weather this season around Australia. Everyone's talking about La Nina, which is all to do with the Pacific Ocean temperatures being the dominant feature. But there's also another weather system up in the north with the tropics, which is also signalling increased cyclonic activity uh, and east coast low patterns, which will also add moisture to the top end of the country. Um, we've also got the Indian Ocean Dipole, which is signalling uh, increased moisture for east and south southern Australia. And then there's the other one that runs down uh, south of Australia um, called the Southern Annular Node, which is all about the trade winds. And they're sitting very low at the moment, which means the dominant winds are running low, which are stirring up maritime breezes, which brings more moisture into the Australia as well. So you've got these four big climate drivers that the Bureau are watching, which means increased chance of rainfall and wet weather. And the whole outlook for most of New South Wales and South Eastern Australia is increased risk of coastal erosion and east coast low events, uh, riverine flooding, um, um, rainfall and, and storm events. So fire is going to take a back seat, but we're moving into to weather event, uh, water events. Interestingly, in the February rainfall event that we had, which finally broke up some of the, some of the fire weather that was dominating so much, took the Warragamba Dam from 40-something percent to 80-something percent um, within a few days. The catchment was pretty significant. We've now got the dam just under 100 percent. So if we even get another February rainfall event, there is no, there is no um, flood mitigation capacity in the dam. It's a storage dam. So it will, it will end up spilling over and feeding the system. If we get an east coast low that then fills up the, the Hawkesbury and the other river systems in the area, you've got the very real potential of flooding uh, in Western Sydney, which is why there's been a considerable effort in the last 12 months around increasing awareness and, and hopefully getting families and businesses to be taking the risk of flood very seriously and giving thought to what that means for how they're positioned, what they're doing, because if it does eventuate, we don't have the luxury of time to move hundreds of thousands of people, their animals, their, their horses, their cows, whatever it is they've got. So it, it, it has a very serious potential to impact uh, Western Sydney and North Western Sydney. Is it your job to get everyone prepared for that? Uh, we've got lead agencies like the SES and infrastructure, but as, as the new role in resilience, uh, it's certainly my role to be getting confidence across government and tying the bits together to ensure that we are individually and collectively doing all we can to prepare for, um, inform and educate as much as we can, but then also have the arrangements in place that in the event that it happens, what are the trigger points and thresholds for certain decisions and actions that need to be given consideration to, and particularly that affects the movement of people, which is why we've seen things like evacuation routes and improvements in road infrastructure, 
Um, but, but all the analysis shows, as we've seen through the, through the literature and the awareness campaigns, um, all that we're talking about is flood mitigation. The word's not prevention. So, so, so um, all we're talking about is mitigating and individuals, families and businesses need to do their part in mitigating um, because we're not going to prevent it. We've got a little bit of time for questions, um, if anyone's got any questions. We don't have roving mics because of COVID, um, but if you just yell them at me, I can re restate them for the back of the room. And, and I think um, what, what Bruce also... I'm just thinking everyone up there wouldn't have heard the question, so... If, oh, you can do it too. Like, I don't mind. I think you should control the world, personally. I just <laughs> think you should Chris, control Chris, this broadcast. Chris, Chris, Chris I think Chris you thinks. should be Prime Minister, maybe the US President. <laughs> like, I don't know about you, but... I, I, I think I, you need to relay the question, Chris. <laughs> Basically what Bruce is saying, look, part, part of resilience is building some strong local employment and strong local job opportunities and growth and things like the Nepean Business Park looking like they're in a lot of strife. Is there anything that Shane can do about that? We just want to add another thing to your, your list of jobs. Look, it won't, it won't surprise you in this current role or in my previous role as Commissioner, no matter what community event I went to, someone would raise an issue in that local community that really mattered to them uh, and sought my support in trying to do anything I could uh, back through government and having spoken to Bruce I think one of the most important things you've got is you've got a very um, you've got a very active local member who understands and appreciates very much what's going on and will understand the issues Stuart Ayres um, and I'm on a I'm on a committee with Stuart which is the cabinet crisis committee which is looking at recovery and and particularly the contemplations around um, uh, stimuli and and recovery inputs from government to help with that, that, that recovery process at a local and statewide level. So I'll certainly be um, talking with Stuart uh, and I also connect with, with BPI as we mentioned. So I'll, I'll be raising it. I'm not going to say I can do anything, but at least, at least having heard it, I can say this bloody bloke Bruce who was really passionate about it and you need to understand this matters. So, so look, I, I get it. I, I do appreciate it. And um, uh, yes, I will be able to raise it in those different forums. He's like Gandhi, really, isn't he? <laughs> Any other questions? Which I can relay? Okay, I got one. Have you thought about going into politics? Um, I have. I mean, a long time ago, I thought the idea of going into politics was really good. There's something quite virtuous about the idea that if you represent your local community, you can get in there and do all these things for your local community. But the closer I've worked with politics, I don't think it's quite that... Um, uh, fanciful, um, and the bottom line is, I think I'd be divorced if I went into politics. Um, and that's well, not, not that I think I know I would be because it's been made abundantly clear to me. Don't you dare! Um, because I do think um, I do think we are ridiculously cruel to our politicians in any case. And whilst a role like the commissioner of the RFS, and you've got to do a few interviews here and there and things like that, you you are put into a public space. Um, that public pressure is really challenging at the best of times, but I think as politicians, it doesn't matter what they say, what they do, you know, we are, we are vitriolic in so many ways with the way we treat them. Don't get me wrong, you know, there's some politicians that are just as moronic as the person next door, but, and they probably deserve a bit of a beat up, but I think as society, I don't think I'd be cut out for that. I think I'd be, I'd be too open with my views. It would be too hard to hold a party line on everything that I didn't necessarily agree with, so I'm just not sure politics is cut out for me. I, I have been approached by a number of people to consider it and request it, and I've politely declined them and said I'm pretty comfortable where I am. Okay, last question. Who's going to win the grand final? <laughs> well, what sort of a question is that? Of course it's going to be Pedro. Look, like, I've got to say... I, I, you I played have... footy, though. You were a football player, weren't you? Oh, I, I, played, I played union when I was younger, but um, I was thinking about you on the way here because I don't think... The big cat families mix too well, do they? Tigers <laughs> and Panthers. I think, I think you're outnumbered here. But, but the, um, I was just so impressed that people came to this lunch to talk about commerce and business 
when you've got the grand final only a couple of days away and you've got the big... big oh, there you go. Well, no, no one knew What are you there. saying? You would have gone there to the grand final fight. lunch if you'd known. You can't say that to Gandhi. Now, look, I, I, think it, I think it would be wonderful after 17 years to see, to see Penrith come through with another grand final win. And, and I do have a small story because I grew up on the northern beaches and... We won't most, hold that against you. I know, most people no. do. The, um, and I've learnt that it's okay to be hated when you grow up on the northern beaches, and particularly uh, when you barrack for Manly or the Sea Eagles, right? So, no, we can't so, be friends anymore. Well, well, well as, a, as a kid... My grandfather and my grandparents, they were absolute, it's all about manly, but my mum and my grandfather all worked in Flemington Markets and we were, we were very close with family and friends out in Penrith and, and um, 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 uh, Campbelltown, that sort of area, uh, and Parramatta, who used to do a lot of market gardening and transport and things like that. And the rivalry all the time in our household was whenever Manly was playing Parramatta or whenever Manly was playing uh, Panthers, and it wasn't until I became a late teenager or, a, or an early adult that I finally saw the old episode of the fibros versus the silver tails and just realised how dangerous it was to say you were a Pan Ruger supporter. I never had any idea. So, but now I'm OK with it. I've kind of grown up. So, yeah, now Penrith, I think, should deserve the win on Sunday. And given their form, they've got to go in, but they're not ranking as favourites, I've just heard on the way in on the radio. So Melbourne is still coming in as favourites in the odds. Yeah, but Melbourne cheat. I, They're look, a pack of wrestlers. Well, I t- I t- if it's a grand final and the Eagles aren't in it, I will go for any team in New South Wales uh, that's playing against um, Queensland or a, or a Victorian team. So, yeah, I'm, all, I'm obviously going to go for Pan- Panthers this year. It's OK. Well, even though you're from the Insular Peninsula, you can be a token Westie for the weekend. That's it. Proudly um, so. <laughs> and it's been wonderful having you here and... I don't know about you, but I feel like we're in very safe hands with you as the Resilience Commissioner. Thank you so much for being here. Really appreciate it. Thanks, Chris. Thank you, everyone. You're not off the hook yet. We've got to draw the business card raffle, which I think Mary's hastily getting the, the box. We, by the way, we're not scheduled to finish till 2.30, so feel free to stay. Um, but would you mind being my barrel girl? I wish I had letters for you to turn, you know, like the old wheel of torture, the things like that. Are we getting last minute business cards in the drawer? <laughs> You've got to thank um, Lisa, Lauren and Sarah as well for loaning you to the state all through the fires. This is the commissioner's wife and daughters. So on behalf of all of us here, can you thank them as well? Here we go. This is for the... Do we, do we start at the first prize and work our way down or start at the third prize? Okay. I haven't got mine on either, so we could both be in deep trouble. I think it says Malcolm Small. Malcolm Small. Baker's Group. Ah, oh, one of Ted's boys. One of our major sponsors. Is that the one you gave me? I put it in my pocket. Uh, okay. Uh, legitimate draw. Malcolm, you've won. I love doing this. i got to sort of get my... Deep voice on. Malcolm, you've won a night's accommodation for two people at the McCure Panthers. Generously donated by Andrew Mills and the McCure Penrith Panthers. Congratulations. Okay. Yeah. No kissing. <laughs> no, no dancing. Oh, no, we're allowed to dance now in limited numbers, aren't we? Okay. I think so. At weddings. Didn't we change that recently? Yeah, limited numbers. Okay. Next the one. next one is Luke Patton. Arch Luke Patton. Luke, congratulations. You've won a family pass to Scenic World Katoomba, generously donated by John Anderson and the team at Mitronics. Or Mitronics? 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 Excellent. Okay. And lucky third prize is... Oh. Somebody... I think that was going to you again. Oh, oh well, it is a different name, <laughs> but it's, it's the, the same. Boss. It's Ted Baker. <laughs> <laughs> Get up, boy. Redraw. Okay. Love you, love you, Ted. Thanks, Ted. Do you know I've been to, I've been to so many dinners through the brigade movement and things like that, and I and I always go to these raffle draws, and I just write it off as a donation. The 
only thing I've ever won was a complimentary ride in the RFS helicopter, and I thought, well, yeah, I, I threw that one back too. This one's Bernard Feehan. Bernard Feehan, come on down, Bernard. Okay, this is what it says on the piece of paper, and I'm reading it. Bernard, you've won a gift that doesn't suck. A beautifully designed and hand-finished pot succulent and complete DIY kit to get your hands dirty and build your own pothead planter. Thank you, Mary Donnelly from Pothead Planters for the gift that doesn't suck. Congratulations. Um, and um, let's just thank um, a, a tireless public servant who doesn't suck. They're pretty rare. Shane Fitzsimmons, thank you. Um, ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for having me. I've really enjoyed being here and to have the opportunity of speaking to Shane again in an inter interview that you can actually let breathe. Um, the, the, the scary thing about media these days for, for me is it's rare to be able to do a long-form interview because everybody's so time poor and rushed, rushed, rushed. And I know during the fire season, you know, you'd, you'd talk to Shane, you'd know he'd have so much more to tell you, but he was either time poor because he had a million media organisations chasing after him or you just can't do it in these days where you need a 15 second sound bite. But as you heard, I think there are people like Shane who have so much more to say and it's wonderful to actually be in a forum where I didn't have to interrupt him because I had a floor manager yelling at me saying, no, we've got to get out to the commercial break, you know, yada, yada, yada. So it was, um, it was a real honour to be asked here today and also to get some words of wisdom from Shane. I've, I've really enjoyed it, so thank you. We also want to say a massive thank you to Chris Barr for agreeing to be with us today. He's doing such an amazing job. So we have a, a little gift hamper here. Local goods. It looks very slimming. It's been good in COVID. I've learned how to make sourdough, which is really bad for your waistline. <laughs> and also thank you so much to our very special guest today. Thank you, Shane. So thank you to all of you. Any including our incredible sponsors today. They have really made it. So thank you for everybody for coming. And uh, we're going to do a little... So mingle amongst yourselves, finish your desserts, enjoy a little bit more wine perhaps. And then anybody who would like to make a little testimonial, we're Facebook-living, so come and see us out front. Enjoy your lunch.